minke whales make their way into these placid waters in summer. This is the most abundant whale in the Southern Ocean. Minkies are one of the smallest of all the baleen whales, and like all others, they come here to feed. The majestic humpback whales are also summer visitors. They have traveled thousands of miles from their winter breeding grounds in the tropics to gather the food that becomes available here in summer. In just four months, they accumulate enough fat to provide them with energy for the whole of the rest of the year. All these animals have come here in search of one thing the krill. Krill is the mainstay of the Antarctic food web. It occurs in phenomenal quantity, billions of individuals in a single swarm, and swarms can stretch for miles. Fur seals also collect this rich, superabundant food. Krill swarms are very patchy, but once found, feeding is easy. engulf hundreds of thousands of them in a single gargantuan mouthful. When the going is good, the whales feed continuously, each eating up to two tons of krill in 24 hours. At some times of the year, seasonal changes make the currents especially rich in nutrients, and then the ocean around the seamount becomes a virtual soup of plankton. At such times, hunters gather in astonishing numbers. Bonito, smaller relatives of the tuna. They're searching for still smaller plankton feeders that have been attracted by the bloom. So are these jacks, and their prey is nearby. A school of anchoveta has strayed up near the surface, even though it's broad daylight and hunters are on the prowl. These small fish can already feel the vibrations of the approaching predators. Swimming at speed, they formed into a ball, and now they must wait for whatever comes. They've been detected. At first, 
the sheer scale of the bait ball seems to daunt the predators. But now the Bonito arrive and launch the first attack. Still the bait ball holds together. The young yellowfin tuna move in. The speed of this attack is so great that gradually groups of anchovetta are splintered from the main fish ball. One such place is the Sea of Ukuts in far eastern Russia. This is the island of Talan. Throughout the long Arctic winter, it's encircled by ice. But as spring approaches, that begins to break up, and seabirds that have spent the winter feeding out on the open ocean far to the south begin to return. Its isolated position and steep cliffs make Talan a perfect nesting site. The tufted puffins arrive first. These are the Pacific cousins of our less spectacular Atlantic species. Horn puffins soon follow. In all, 14 different species return to Talan each spring and in just a few weeks, the once silent cliffs come alive to the calls of four million breeding seabirds. This is a multi-story avian city. Assembling in these dense colonies, after having spent a largely solitary life at sea, provides the birds with the social stimulation that is the key to coordinating their breeding. By nesting and laying together, they ensure that most of their chicks will leave the nest at exactly the same time. Just like the turtles, this is the way they spread the impact of predators. The world's largest eagle, Stella's sea eagle, a third as big again as a golden. Throughout the summer, the eagles hunt in Talan's crowded colonies. Riding on the updrafts, they patrol the top of the cliffs, looking out for any kittiwake that ventures too far from the rock face. Suddenly, the huge eagle stoops with the aerial agility of a falcon. Coordinating panic among the kittiwakes confuses their attacker. But the eagle doesn't give up. And it 
Peter's got one. This is the freshly dead carcass of a 30-ton grey whale. It's resting on the seafloor a mile down. It's only been on the bottom for six weeks, but already it has attracted hundreds of hagfish. These ancient scavengers are nearly always the first to discover a fallen body and are attracted from miles around. They lack jaws and rasp at the flesh with two rows of horny teeth on either side of their sucker-like mouths. Next to arrive, a sleeper shark, a real deep sea specialist. They grow to over seven meters long and have never been filmed at such a depth before. The gaping wounds in the whale's flank are its work. Unlike the hagfish, it has powerful jaws, so is able to rip off huge chunks of meat. Sharks, hagfish, and a whole succession of different deep sea scavengers will feast on the carcass for years before all its nutriment is gone. 18 months later, when we return to this whale, all that was left was a perfect skeleton stripped bare. It was almost as if a museum specimen had been carefully laid out on the sea floor. At first, the skeleton seemed totally abandoned, but even after so long, there was still some flesh left in the head. Hagfish have a skeleton of cartilage and are so flexible that they can tie themselves into knots and so get a better purchase on the flesh they feed on. But smaller organisms had fed here. A thick band of white bacteria had formed on the mud, outlining the original shape of the whale. And on the skeleton itself, colonies of specialized bacteria were extracting energy from the bones themselves. Most remarkably, and in huge abundance, polychaete worms were collecting the last edible fragments. These are a new species that so far have only been found on the fallen bodies of whales. Scientists have discovered 178 different animals on a single whale vertebra, most of which have been found nowhere else. Humphead parrotfish, nearly a meter and a half in length. Their jaws are so powerful, they can bite through rock. When they descend to feed, the reef itself is under threat. They are indiscriminate feeders, taking both rock and coral alike in their quest for algae. These fish play a large part in the erosion of the reef. The rock and coral they swallow emerges later as a fine sand. On a single reef, they can produce tons of it every year. This soft sand forms the tropical beaches that we find so alluring.
Over time, the sand builds up to form an island, which is then colonised by animals and plants. Trees take root. Birds arrive. The guano from thousands of terns which have chosen to nest here enriches the sandy soil which then can support more plants. <laughs> 